Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the 11th episode of Breaking Monero. This is a special episode where we have a mailbag Q&A session where people have submitted questions in the previous episodes of Breaking Monero, and we're going to answer them for you. We have, uh, of course, me, Justin, on, and we have Brandon and Sarang on with us today. Um, so we have a lot of questions that we can go through, and we hope that this will be able to help cover some of the gaps that we either needed to re-clarify in some of the Breaking Monero series or just other questions that you felt were relevant for the Monero Research Lab uh, contributors. So um, welcome, Brandon. Welcome, Sarang. Uh, so the first question that came in that we're going to cover from episode two said that during um, a Monero talk episode, Andrew Polstra brought up the idea where Monero could have either uh, perfect anonymity with how it how it shields funds, or perfect guarantee that funds cannot be um, can it cannot be created. Can you talk about the uh, sort of the perfectly binding versus perfectly hiding thing, Serang? Yeah. So I'm, I'm assuming that what this actually is talking about, um, and, I, and I admit I haven't seen this episode, so I don't know exactly what Andrew's words were. Um, but the idea is that Monero. Um, and you know some other types of digital assets uh, basically hide the amount of a transaction in what's called a Peterson commitment, um, and that basically is a way to mask what the amount is, but kind of in an algebraically useful way. And by algebraically useful, I mean that there's operations we can perform on transactions that kind of use elliptic curve algebra and arithmetic um, to basically ensure that you know funds are are not created out of thin air, ideally. Um, so therefore, that the transactions balance. So some nice mathematical properties of these. Uh, um, and in these so-called commitment schemes or hiding schemes, um, there's two properties. Um, there's a property of hiding, which means that um, even an all-powerful adversary either can or cannot determine what the um, the hidden amount of that transaction was. There's a property that is called uh, binding. Um, and binding property means that it would or would not be possible for um, an all-powerful prover or user of the system to be able to uh, basically open a commitment to different values. Um, so basically, it's like whether, whether or not um, a commitment actually forces you to one particular value. Um, and it turns out, like mathematically, um, you can't really have both of these be completely perfect. So Peterson commitments are, in fact, perfectly hiding, um, in that even an all-powerful, you know, computationally unbounded adversary can never determine what the hidden value is. Um, basically, there's, there's always a way to kind of have deniability in that. Um, but uh, Peterson commitments do not, in fact, have perfect binding. They are so-called um, computationally binding, which means that under certain computational constraints, um, you're basically limited to one particular amount, um, but they're not perfectly binding, which means that you know, an all-powerful you know, prover or user of the system could, in theory, open a commitment to multiple values. And that's not really good um, if you want to ensure you know, that, that it's not ever, ever possible to basically create funds or you know, make transactions that appear to balance, but you know, in fact don't. Um, from a practical perspective, like these are well understood constructions, and these computational constraints are, you know, entirely reasonable. So that's why we call these things like computationally binding and not perfectly binding. Um, there are other commitment schemes. Um, another common one is called the El Gamal commitment scheme, which basically flips that. So an El Gamal commitment scheme, um, if a project were to use that, effectively means that you're no longer perfectly hiding, and that a computationally unbounded adversary could find out what the hidden amount was, um, but in effect, you are perfectly binding, which means that you couldn't later open that commitment to another amount. Um, so the idea about like whether or not Monero can move to something that kind of flips this, um, you know, it's complicated. And, like such a thing would have to be consistent with um, the types of signatures that we use and the kind of range proofs that we use. There was talk in the Bulletproof paper, for example, of how one might go about modifying the protocols um, in a way that would be more computationally and space intensive um, that could flip them to Elgamal commitments. Um, but again, such a thing would have to be, you know, consistent with the other schemes that we use. So practically speaking, you know, this isn't an issue because, you know, we, we assume certain computational constraints um, on adversaries and users of the system. I don't know, Brandon, do you have any comments you want to make uh, regarding commitment schemes? They get a little uh, bit technical if you go into it, but... Sure. Uh, well, yeah. actually, uh, Tim Ruffing is uh, uh, also looking into uh, so, or has looked into something called switch commitments, which I believe you mentioned. Um, and so the idea behind switch commitments is to use something that is uh, perfectly hiding until quantum computers uh, start to break them and then switch over to something that is no longer perfectly hiding, but perfectly binding to prevent quantum computers from screwing around with balances. 
Um, and so one possible route that Monero could go in the future, uh, I'm not saying that we're doing that soon, but uh, one possible route is for us to start using switch commitments specifically to try to get the best of both worlds. We can get the perfectly hiding property for now uh, until we need the binding property later. Do you think that for people who are used to a completely transparent system like Bitcoin, where they're confident in the amount of supply of Bitcoin that is available, that a perfectly um, binding scale is perhaps an easier sell and saying privacy is important, but I'd rather sacrifice privacy if needed, if, if computers become computationally um, you know, uh, competent to be able to handle these tasks. Uh, do, do you foresee that some, these sort of commitment schemes are more likely to make their way into systems like Bitcoin? I definitely think that something like switch commitments would be an easier sell for uh, a project like Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is an extremely conservative project because they are the leaders in a lot of ways. Um, they are at the frontier in terms of research, but uh, they, they don't want to make a move unless, you know, uh, they're absolutely sure that they're not going to be breaking everything, which is a really great and admirable way to go about developing something like a currency. Um, but uh, the thing is, is, you know, to fear post-quantum apocalypse of quantum computers being able to peel apart your Monero balances and seeing how much you own, um, it's not really practical right now. And they're, they're, it's, not a, it's not like a big fear in my mind. And the reason is, is that if post-quantum computers become a thing, Every Amazon transaction is going to become, an, you know, insecure. Um, the entire internet is basically going to fall apart. I mean, not not quite as bad as all that, but post quantum fears are largely overblown right now. And so, um, even though it would be an easier sell to do something like a switch commitment, um, uh, it's again you're preparing for an apocalypse that could never come. And I think I mean, it's also worth noting that, you know, Bitcoin doesn't need to use um, amount commitments because they don't hide amounts. So everything is already kind of wide out in the open anyway. All right, cool. Um, anything else you would like to cover on this question, either Serang or Brandon? Um, uh, Serang, just, just to point out, um, even though Bitcoin doesn't hide amounts, people have proposed in the past to do confidential transactions with Bitcoin without using ring signatures, just hiding amounts, right? And so that was like yeah, fact, I mean, the original confidential asset proposal by Greg Maxwell. So Yeah, it's yeah it was actually happen. originally proposed for Bitcoin, um, and then we ended up adopting it, but in kind of a ring-happy form. Yep, exactly. Oh, okay, so um, in the series, Breaking Monero, we don't really go over the core mathematics. We, nor we more so talk at a high conceptual level for people to understand really what's going on. And so we had one person that asked us, even though we won't go over the mathematics, that they would like to know what some of the text uh, best textbooks are that helps get them introduced to these basics so they can start learning a little bit more about it. So I'm going to start with you again, Sarang. What are some recommendations that you have for people who are you know, perhaps getting started at an undergraduate level and want to learn more about these cryptographic schemes. Well, you're in luck because totally coincidentally, I happen to have two of the books with me right now. Either I brought them in advance or I just keep them right next to me at all times. You get to decide. Um, Nerd. So you... Nerd. Okay. Oh, absolutely. So um, a lot of this kind of depends on what level you want to approach this from and kind of what background you're already coming in with. Uh, so. You know, if you're if you're comfortable and familiar with um, kind of just basic undergraduate algebra and kind of want to take off from there, one good book I'll hold up here by Hofstein, Piper, Piper, and Silverman. It's called An Introduction to Medical Cryptography, and there are newer and older editions. You know, depending on what your needs are. So this kind of does a good job of of introducing some both classical and modern encryption techniques. Uh, just kind of from assuming kind of from the start, just a good solid knowledge of kind of elementary, you know, algebra, kind of high school and college level algebra. It's a good book for that. Um, it's not a good book for a lot of really advanced techniques, um, nor is it really good for secure implementations. So it talks about the math behind it, but, you know, I would not rely on that to do any kind of secure implementation. But it's a very good book. Another one. If you are interested in a bit more formal approach, um, and this this book I would say is not necessarily for the faint of heart. Um, this is Katz and Lindell's Introduction to Modern Cryptography by Katz and Lindell. 
And this book um, is kind of like an advanced undergraduate slash you know, kind of beginning graduate book on a lot of the formalizations behind certain constructions. Um, it's, it's a very, very good, very, very thorough book. Um, I would not say to grab that if you're kind of just getting started, um, but, but it does a really good job of talking about the formalization. So there's a lot of other good ones, but I think that those are two that kind of hit two big levels, both kind of just starting out with the math and really wanting to kind of nail down some of the, of the security proofs and things like that. Excellent. Um, and for those who are watching, I will link all these books and, and um, resources in the description of the video. Okay. Uh, uh, sir Ray, I know you have another one you would like to share. Yes, sir. Um, uh, I just learned the other day that this uh, document called an intensive introduction to cryptography, um, which is a summary, uh, which is a collection of uh, slides and such from Harvard. Um, uh, they're currently using it at Clemson University to teach a blockchain course. Um, so an intensive introduction to cryptography, uh, we'll be including a link uh, later, as Justin just said. Yep, thanks. And the great part about that one is just free PDFs online, so you can just view them. Yeah, um, exactly. It's always nice to get free PDFs. Okay. I'm, sure, I'm sure it is. I'm sure we have no information. <laughs> I, don't know what, I, don't, I, I don't know how to get free PDFs except directly from the authors, so. So I think with that, we can move on to the next question, which is saying uh, they're interested uh, following our fifth episode about how people will use AI and other techniques to find more heuristics on the Monero blockchain. We stated that there was there is no limit to the heuristics people could try to use to learn information about transactions on Monero. And they had a question that asked, is a selection of Monero outputs based on factors related to the real output or are the decoys chosen completely independently of the output? So I do know that we have a question later on in the lineup that's going to talk a little bit more about kind of data that's on or off chain. Um, but just specifically with this question, asking about how outputs are selected, um, you know, the, the way that we've selected outputs and decoys for transactions, um, we did, of course, talk about um, in an earlier episode. And it has been iterated over time. Um, but the answer to the question about whether or not uh, decoys are selected based on factors directly related to the true output that's being spent, the answer to that is no. Um, so we have particular distributions um, and ways that we do that selection, um, and those are, those are intentionally independent of the truly selected output. So you want to have the statistics of the decoy selection be as good and as independent as possible. Um, and as we've talked about, that's been iterated over time. Um, in fact, there will be at the next point release um, a, a little tweak to the way that output selection is being done that'll help to mitigate some, some issues that came up with the way that outputs are weighted based on kind of the size of blocks, for example. So constantly iterated on, it's kind of a theme that we have going on throughout the series, um, is that yes, there are a lot of heuristics that are available and we kind of try to hit the biggest ones and output selection is one of them. So uh, several researchers have recommended that Monero include at least some some sort of binning, and by this I mean some sort of output selection in relation to the real output. So let's say that the output was generated in a specific block. It, one rule potentially would be include one other decoy that comes from that block or include another decoy from any other set time period or any number of circumstances. So how far off are we from really determining whether or not those sort of solutions have a a net positive trade-off and or something we would like to improve, but eventually include in the narrow. Uh, well, actually, that's funny. I'm right now working on Monero Research Labs bulletin number 11, I believe is the number. Um, we're currently running simulations on various methods to see, uh, we want to ask the question, um, how can we uh, ensure that the way that we construct output selection, or the way that we select outputs for ring members, how can we ensure that um, we minimize the probability that somebody can be singled out as the true signer? Um, unfortunately, there's a lot of challenges to this, right? Um, one of the things that we're currently running is large-scale simulations, and we're just raw trying to uh, pick out um, uh, methods that produce the worst, worst, uh, worst results when you try to Break the break the Monero blockchain down. Um, the the main question is uh, whether or not binning is helpful, and to what to what level binning is helpful. Um, and uh, <laughs> this is just currently an active area of research, and um, 
I only have some preliminary results, and I don't want to speak too too much about that. But maybe Sarang has some thoughts. Yeah, I mean, one, you know, there, there are, and again, like there, there have been different proposals over time for how you might do some kind of binning that, you know, selects ring members kind of based on each other, you know, either based on block or time or, or different things. Um, and part of it also just kind of comes down to the practical element, right? You know, if, if our ring size is going to be, you know, a certain number of ring members, you know, and if we know we want a certain kind of time selection, you know, that selects a lot of newer outputs and then a few older outputs based on whatever algorithm you're using, and if you also want to take for certain decoys, you know, bins surrounding those or whatever other scheme you want, you know, eventually you run out of space. Um, so it's it's also kind of an arms race between the things that you'd like to do with output selection and you know, kind of practically what we're willing to accept in terms of ring size. You know, as as we've often said, you know, our larger ring size is better. Like all the things being equal, yes, absolutely. And in terms of binning, totally. There's a whole lot more you can do with them. Um, but that also has a lot of other implications for space and time. Um, you know, other other projects I know take different approaches to ring size, you know, partly for that reason. Um, and, you know, as long as we have the limitations that we do, there's only so much we can do with binning. So if we're going to, you know, move to such a thing at some point, we'd want to make sure that we do it right and in a way that maintains this balance. And not only that, you know, there's there's something that's sort of hidden and implicit in these questions, which is that there's one best way to do it. And the thing is, is um, depending on what your threat model is, sometimes uh, you don't need to do any sort of binning at all. And it's not clear yet what various scales of threat model we're dealing with when it comes to um, making decisions like output selection um, and, and binning in general. And so the, the short answer is, is that it depends and it'll always be context dependent and uh depending on your threat model um it may be unnecessary presently for you to be binning your transact or to using bit using bins in order to construct ring signatures and so as a consequence as a development team should we be focusing on the users who would really benefit the most from binning and then everybody else just has to subsidize the cost to the blockchain if we end up doing some new protocol um or should we you know, uh, take a look at like what the average user is dealing with and what sort of threat model they have to deal with. Because in the end, at the end of the day, if somebody's doing a spear phishing attempt on you, um, where or a spear phishing tracking on you, and they're actually like targeting you as an individual, there's not too much that, uh, you know, all of our privacy research and output selection can really do for you. Um, on the other hand, um, if you're just worried about like large scale, um, passive dragnet style surveillance, um, then maybe Monero is already currently doing wh exactly what you need it to do. Um, it's not really clear. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, both of you. We'll come back to other questions in relation to what people's threat models is later. But I'm going to move on to another question that came in from the seventh episode that was asking for a little bit of clarification between what privacy that Monero provides versus the privacy that is provided with the Lightning Network, and a, a little bit more broadly, what uh, Lightning Network and other off-chain solutions might look like for Monero. Sarang, can you can you give a little bit of background here on, on sort of like what what's the impact of these off-chain solutions? Yeah, so I mean, it's important to differentiate between on-chain transaction solutions and off-chain transaction solutions. So you know, we're all very familiar with on-chain transaction approaches. Um, you know, Bitcoin has an approach to doing transactions on-chain, which has been around for quite a while. Um, Monero has its own on-chain transactions that you know we we as Monero users use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but the idea behind off-chain solutions is that you know if different parties can basically lock up some funds on the chain in whatever way the protocol dictates, you know, do some later verifiable work. You know, to you know, transact between each other or between multiple parties in some kind of broader network approach. You know, and then later kind of settle back up on the chain to make sure that the balance all works out and that you know, no no one was able to steal funds from anyone else. I mean, the idea is that if you can offload a lot of that computation and a lot of that that space, that could be good for verification times. That could be good for payment times. That could be good for you know, blockchain space scaling and things like that. Um, in Bitcoin, it's a bit more straightforward. Um, and in Monero, it's quite a bit more complicated. And part of the reason for that is there's certain plumbing that you need in place. So for example, in Bitcoin, you know, if you lock up funds for some kind of off-chain solution based on whatever protocol you want to use, um, if something goes wrong, you need a way to be able to abort that and you know, return the funds to whomever locked them up. Well, that works out well, pretty well in Bitcoin because you, know, you can tell where funds came from. So 
you know, the protocol can basically non-interactively just dictate that those funds get returned. But in Monero, of course, ideally you don't know where funds came from. So while it's easy, at least fairly easy to do an interactive refund where I can just send funds back to you if I know who you are, um, it's not possible right now to do that non-interactively and just have the protocol automatically take care of it. And there are some proposals for ways that we could introduce new plumbing to take care of this, um, but like, but the math and crypto are, are quite complicated and there's a lot of different subtleties involved. So you know that among other things is just why it's a lot more difficult to Monero. It comes down to the math and the plumbing and the fact that ours is quite different than a lot of other solutions. So you know we'd like to be able to do such a thing, but it's going to have to be a lot more custom than what, say, some other projects might be able to do. Anything you'd like to add, Brandon? Um, mainly the 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 comparison of the Lightning Network off-chain stuff to the on-chain stuff. Uh, Serang did a delightful job uh, describing. Um, the main thing is. is a lot of off-chain solutions for Monero are just going to have to function very differently. And it's an active area of research, just like a lot of other things. Unfortunately, this is my usual answer when people ask me questions is it depends and we'll find out soon. All right. Thanks again. Uh, so the next question is um, related to our ninth episode. And there are many people that watch uh, the sort of three of us go through and, and test heuristics, share heuristics that can be used in the Monero blockchain. And they become very disappointed. They, they say, wow, I mean, there, there's so many things people can do to learn information about how people are using Monero. Is there really ever going to be a solution where maybe we, we don't need to worry about this at all, um, where ultimately that, I mean, you, it's, it, it ultimately is a black box that no one can actually see anything going on there. So uh, based off the trade-offs that we have today, um, I know that's, well, let's start with you, uh, Saray. So what are what's your take on people who say, well, I, I'm disappointed that there are so many limitations to existing cryptocurrencies. Will there ever be a, a privacy cryptocurrency that is perfect? Uh, the short answer is, it depends on what you mean by perfect. Just like a moment ago, everything depends and everything is context dependent. Um, people like to throw the word fungible around a lot, right? So let's think about a fungible commodity, something that literally an ounce of it here can be exchanged for an ounce here and you can never really tell where it came from. Like the classic example of a fungible commodity is oil, right? Barrels of oil. Um, well, we can track those things. We can either track the barrel itself, or if I really want to track the oil inside, I can taint it with some radioactive isotope and later I can test for it. And I can find out whether or not the oil in this new barrel came from the barrel I was tracing in the first place. And so if you're talking about um, trying to eliminate uh, the traceability of some sort of commodity, uh, just in general, uh, you have to recognize there are certain limitations the most fungible things in the world are um, still pretty traceable. Um, a black hole leaks information about the contents beyond the event horizon. There's no way that we can reasonably expect that some magic snarks come out next year that will protect your financial information from all prying eyes forever. Um, so I think there's a level of practicality that we have to expect out of these projects. If you're trying to design the perfect encryption system, um, but you give away your private keys. It wasn't a very good encryption system. It doesn't matter how good the good encryption system was. So um, uh, when people use things like know your customer exchanges, when people use um, the internet without using Tor or without using VPN or something along those lines, um, they're just fundamentally leaking data all over the place. And all that data is this off-chain data that has nothing to do with stuff that actually ends up on chain, just like Sarang was mentioning a moment ago. Um, so I think the practical problem here is that people want perfect privacy and it's impossible. Um, however, we can expect things like plausible deniability in a court of law, stuff like that. I think that um, being able to provide reasonable privacy tools does not necessarily mean absolutely perfectly shielding everybody from every possible threat. It's just not practical. Uh, maybe Sarang has different opinions. Yeah, I mean, I, I like thinking about the difference between kind of like on-chain um, data that's available and off-chain data that may be available. You know, on-chain is just saying, you know, suppose that all you get is, you know, a USB stick that contains the blockchain. You get no other information. You go into a sealed room and see what information you can pull out. Um, and of course, we've talked a lot about, you know, the ways that 
Um, the ways that Monero kind of has evolved throughout the years has kind of changed what information is, you know, available there. You know, in some cases, you know, it is possible to extract certain amounts of information about like the structure of the blockchain, but we try to mitigate that as much as we can over time. Um, and, you know, as we always say, like it's an iterative approach, you know, a lot of fixes introduce other subtleties that, you know, we want to make sure that we understand the risk benefit reward of. Um, but of course, like, again, off-chain data is, you know, a lot more broad in a lot of ways, right? Your ISP knows a lot about you. If you interact with exchanges, um, you know, those exchanges can get information about you, um, depending on the network level solutions that you might use, like Tor, I2P, or VPN. Um, the way that we relay transactions themselves, you know, from node to node, you know, can in theory leak information. Like, those things are, are also things that we want to keep working on. Um, but, you know, there, there are a lot of different challenges there. So we want to hit the threat models that we feel like, you know, we can reasonably hit. And otherwise, we just keep iterating on solutions as we understand the risk benefit reward to do. I think the two of you put that really well. Thank you. Um, because I know that, as you all stated, everyone wants perfect privacy. But we can't get perfect privacy, but we can probably get good enough depending on the use case. So I think that was framed really well. Um, so uh, for the next question, if they, they ask, what if Bitcoin core devs decide to implement all of Monero's features? Will that make Monero obsolete? Will Monero no longer have a purpose if, if you know, Bitcoin today just is like, we're adding ring signatures or we're adding ring ZT? What is your take? Uh, well, we can start with Serang. Um, so, I mean, we talked a little bit about this before and I said, my God, that would be an amazing problem to have, which, you know, I, I still hold, I still hold to be true, right? You know, like I would love for people to care about, you know, financial privacy in this way. Um, you know, right now, you know, a lot of folks are fine with using something that's transparent like Bitcoin, um, where, you know, either their threat model does not necessarily, you know, um, prevent the use of such a thing, or if this is not something that they think about. Um, if Bitcoin or some other asset were to add fantastic privacy features and people are start using, you know, more privacy conscious digital assets, I think that's great. You know, I, I've never thought about this space as being a zero sum game where, you know, if if one project or asset does better then all the other ones must do worse. I don't think that that's necessarily true. Um, you know, a lot of this comes from, you know, academia and the computer science and math world, you know, where where information and ideas are shared and implemented where they make sense. You know, and that's that's how this works. You know, we, we get a lot of ideas from, from all over the place. A lot of them make it into Monero. Our hope is that some things that we do can make it onto other projects and make them better. Um, and I think that the entire space grows as folks better understand how to make privacy better. And in addition to that, so what I love about this question, and I brought this up before we shot this, um, what I love about this question is that it reminds me of the ship of Theseus from philosophy or like if you have a broom, right? And the broom handle breaks and you replace the broom handle and then and then all the, the brushes at the end of the broom, like, you know, they, they get worn out and you replace the, the brush part of the broom and then you have, is it the same broom as it was? If you replace every plank on a ship, is it still the same ship? Um, if Monero's underlying technology ended up getting implemented into Bitcoin, would it still be Bitcoin? Um, would the new implementation just be a different implementation of Monero? I don't know how that would work. And it's it's kind of like asking, what if the sky was blue or uh, was purple? It's like, I don't know, what if, man? Um, it's an interesting question, but uh, like, like Serang said, it would be a really good problem to have. If the Monero approach behind ring signatures or anonymity sets or Hiding amount commit uh, commitment com hiding amounts with commitments became popular with the Bitcoin core devs um, for privacy reasons. I would call that a win for everybody, just across the board. So yeah, yeah. I mean, all of these assets, you know, to some extent, they are tools to solve certain problems. And if Monero, if you decide that Monero is the correct tool to solve your problem, then by all means, use it. And if you decide that something else down the road ends up solving a different problem or the same problem better. Um, then by all means, go and use that. You know, our goal is to our goal is to constantly try to be the best tool available. Even though I'm uh, sort of a Monero shill and a Bitcoin maximalist, I'm not really a maximalist or a shill for any project because the thing is, is you know, if every single cryptocurrency, if they're doing their job, every single one can function like a bank. And it's kind of absurd to look at the world that's around us and come to the conclusion that there will only be one bank. Um, if history has taught us anything. Sometimes, it sometimes seems that way, though. <laughs> well, When has that ever gone wrong? 
I was at the Denver airport and the Illuminati symbols everywhere were absolutely, I mean, I was like the Rothschilds are watching, watching me right now, man. All right. So the next question, I think this is a really good one. Uh, they asked, what is something that few people often, even within the Monero community, uh, do not seem to understand uh, that you wish people had a better knowledge of? And it could either be positive or negative, just something that sort of sets Monero apart from different projects. So I, I know that uh, Brandon touched on this earlier, but for example, in, in my case, one thing that I really wish people, even within the Monero community, had a better understanding of is the idea of fungibility and how Monero's fungibility is provided by plausible deniability, not perfect privacy to perfect fungibility. So in, from my view, is since we can't have perfect privacy, we can't have perfect fungibility either. We can get good enough for it to not matter. So we shouldn't just dismiss fungibility as something you should worry about if it's important. But likewise, we can't necessarily say all the time that it's perfect in every use case. So uh, hearing my example, um, Brandon, what do you think is one example where you wish people knew a little bit more about Monero, something you need to keep reminding people about? Uh, so Monero is... Uh, it's actually not really a technological thing because most people don't know too much about the tech behind Monero. If you talk to people, they might have heard of ring signatures or key images, but um, even in the cryptocurrency space, our technology isn't, um, uh, it's its novel compared to some of the stuff in Bitcoin. Um, but what thing, one thing that I do enjoy having to explain to people a lot is the decentralized nature of the Monero pro project because we are totally non-hierarchical and we take that really seriously and it's actually um, sort of problematic. So if I'm speaking to like professors at a university, they try to wrap their mind around the governance structure at Monero and they just can't do it because they're like talking, you know, they're coming from this perspective of a university professor and there's deans and provosts above them and there's grad students below them and there's a clear hierarchy. And um, really what it comes down to is, uh, the Monero community is one of the most demo like little d democratic uh, communities that I've ever had the joy of experiencing before because every it seems like almost everybody has a voice and if one person gets shouted down it's because they're being perceived by the majority as a, as being a jerk or being wrong or being a troll or something along those lines. So the lack of structure and the lack of a legal entity behind the Monero community is actually one of the things that I have a hard time explaining, even to like hardcore Bitcoin people who think they're all about decentralized open source projects. Thanks, Brandon. What about you, Serain? Um, I think for me, it, it kind of comes down to the idea of, of iterative changes. You know, I mean, if, if anything's clear from the series that we've done so far, you know, I think one important lesson is that there is a very, very large potential, you know, attack and analysis surface to a decentralized digital asset, you know, and especially a decentralized digital asset like Monero, you know, whose goal is to work toward privacy and fungibility. Um, and so what that means is that, you know, changes that we make to, you know, kind of one part of, of the protocol or to the client software, for example, can have a lot of other effects on other parts of the protocol in the client software. So what that often means is that, you know, what might seem like a fantastic fix or change, you know, might have other impacts that are either understood to be not so good or that are, you know, fairly poorly understood. Um, and so as a result, a lot of what we do for the changes that we make, a lot of it comes down to kind of risk benefit analysis and trying to determine what the effects of those changes are going to be and whether or not we consider the benefits that they bring to outweigh the downsides. So, you know, it's, it's, there's a whole lot of things that are kind of on the table as things that we could do. And, you know, the number of things that we actually do is going to end up being a lot smaller in part because of that. Um, and again, that doesn't mean that, you know, we shouldn't continue to strive to do better. Like that's one of our goals is to, you know, always iterate to try to do better than possible. Um, but I guess I wish I, I wish more people understood the idea that, you know, because this is a very large, complex potential attack surface, that, you know, there, there are a lot of different trade-offs that we have to consider. And hopefully we continue to do a really good job of, of kind of analyzing those trade-offs whenever possible. Where do the two of you see Monero in five or 10 years? And what do you think it'll take to, to really get there? What, what changes do you imagine will, will happen? Oh, man. Um, you know, I guess I... I guess what I would like to see personally is for us to kind of in the more short term, you know, do do a better job of 
of kind of closing up any you know kind of remaining bits of metadata that may be floating around. Um, you know, again, like it's it's impossible to to kind of fully remove any you know, elements of metadata, but you know things like you know continuing to try to optimize output selection um, and looking at you know transaction relay and network level solutions. You know, maybe you know being able to make um, proving systems, you know, as a bit smaller and more efficient to help space and verification time. Um, and I guess in the longer term, you know, like I've always said, you know, moving away from ring signatures and small anonymity sets would be pretty great because a lot of the issues that we have surrounding our transaction graph, you know, ultimately in some sense come from the fact that we have a fairly limited anonymity set from ring signatures. You know, it's that's a very, very complicated thing to try to move away from. There's a lot of limitations in place because we're not willing to accept things like trusted setups. Um, and of course, any solution that we would adopt would need to be compatible with kind of the existing, you know, protocols so that we could, you know, get everyone kind of moved over to a new system. So I would like to see us there, you know, whether or not that's kind of on the horizon is still, I think, kind of an open question. Uh, one of the really interesting thing that's things that have happened over the past two years uh, has been this explosion in cryptography research, uh, applied cryptography research. Um, there have been more papers published with novel zero knowledge proving systems that are parallelizable and linear and you know all these nice properties. Uh, it has come out <laughs> like basically once a month, I'm, I'm, I'm finding some new paper that totally blows my mind. And um, so anticipating where we are five to 10 years from now is kind of scary. I kind of feel like we're um, pretty close to, uh, um, it, you know, I don't want to be like one of those futurist singularity guys, but like there is so much stuff coming out. I cannot anticipate what next year is going to look like compared to five years from now. Um, but I would like to say that, uh, I mean, like I would love personally to see something like Monero's ring signatures replaced with um, larger scale anonymity set authentication that's closer to Zcash style or Zcash size anonymity sets um, without violating our efficiency problems. If we can do that, then that solves the output selection questions that we were discussing earlier. Um, it can solve an enormous, if people are tra transmitting their transactions using Tor or something like that, um, then it solves an enormous number of uh, linking metadata issues with blockchain information. Um, personally, I would like to see Monero totally overhauled so that uh, it's, it's as efficient as possible while providing the best scale of default always on privacy. And that's such a tenuous rule, like, I don't know, two years from now, somebody might come up with some scheme that is gonna rewrite the whole thing. Um, but one thing that I find very important about Monero is the human rights component behind the privacy element of Monero, and Zcash also, honestly. Um, these two projects in a lot of places across the world, Venezuela, um, uh, I actually, you know what, everybody uses Venezuela as an example, but uh, my understanding is that there's a variety of other countries around the world right now that are dealing with um, inflation issues and with uh, <sighs> tyrannical regimes that are using capital controls in order to run their people's economies. And I think that the human rights component of tools like Monero are going to become more and more of an issue over the next five to 10 years. So I'm not exactly sure where the technology behind Monero is going to be. But I do know that five to 10 years from now, we're gonna be having um, a very large scale social discussion on privacy and what the everyday citizens should be expecting compared to what the top level citizens are actually receiving. Um, and so uh, I personally want to contribute to a bunch of projects that are producing privacy technology that are gonna help people five, 10 years from now um, buy banned books I mean, if you're if you if you want to buy a copy of the Bible in North Korea, then you probably don't want to use a credit card um, or the, or the credit system that they have over there. So uh, I think that the human rights component behind Monero is really what's going to be driving discussion over the next couple of years, not so much the technology. Um, that's might be a little bit of a controversial opinion in this crowd. I don't have anything personally to add to that. Um, so I think uh, since Serang's keeping pretty quiet too, I think we'll move on to the next question, which we sort of covered answering the, the previous one. So uh, it is, what is something that you wish could be improved upon that is not something that you, that, like if you had the ability to just flick a magic switch and have Monero implement immediately, but is still in the 
middle of achieving community consensus. There might be some disagreement still on the actual implementation, these sort of things. Um, and I, for me personally, I have two things I really want to talk about. So first, our payment IDs. I would love to get rid of them. I would love to say just only use sub addresses. Let's get rid of them as soon as possible. And the second thing is, I wish that in general, the Monero community was a little bit more aggressive at uh, banning dumb behavior on the consensus layer as much sooner when it's discovered. So um, things like prohibiting transactions from having only one output, I think should be something that we should be very open to in a Monero community and not something that we're like, well, let's just make it a wallet default. I mean, I think that Monero is one of the best communities at making these consensus changes, but I wish that we were even more aggressive against these small little dumb metadata things that maybe people aren't doing at a large scale, but they shouldn't be doing at all. So, um, Sarang, are uh, there any other things that you that are sort of annoying you that you wish you could just snap your fingers and, and have implemented in, you know, Monero Serang diet fork or whatever it is? <laughs> Um, I mean, in general, I agree. You know, I think I think that ideally we would be more aggressive about trying to make transactions a lot more uniform. You know, to the extent that's reasonable um, via consensus, um, just to ensure that you know all you know different wallet solutions or different approaches don't end up um, you know being potentially detrimental to people's privacy. You know, and you know besides that, you know we're still we're working on like potential changes to signature schemes. And, you know, once those are solid and in place, I wouldn't say that's like a controversial thing right now or anything, but, you know, I see that those, I see those solutions possibly improving um, space scaling and, you know, verification times and things that I think could be, you know, beneficial, you know, not like world changing or anything, but, you know, nice optimizations. I like to optimize. Uh, speaking of optimizations, uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, Serang being responsible for 99% speed ups in bulletproofs is sort of the optimization that he's talking about. It's pretty nuts. Um, what do I wish was different about Monero that I could just snap my fingers and unilaterally change? Um, rather than answering the question that way, I think I would answer the question: um, What am I jealous in? Uh, jealous of in other projects? And I'm jealous of grins flexibility in their proof of work attitudes. Um, the different proof of work stuff that's going on with Grin in order to transition from GPU to ASICs over several years um, with the mining schedule that they use. Um, I find that stuff really, really interesting. Um, and I, I find that Monero's approach to proof of work, while also very interesting, um, uh, I, I would prefer to do something uh, that's sort of transitioning towards ASICs that are commoditized rather than um, just trying to hold off the ASICs for as long as possible. Um, but this is a long ongoing conversation and I don't have a solution. Otherwise I would write up a proposal and then I would unilaterally be trying to make a change. So that's not really the question, is it? Anyway. No, thank you. So I, those are the main questions that we had come through. Um, so Brandon, you had a few last things that you wanted to leave the uh, viewer with that you feel are very important. Well, one, uh, well, actually, only one of them is important. The, the other one is very unimportant. The really unimportant one is somebody asked like what our hobbies are, and I was the only one willing to talk about my personal hobby. I love bonsai trees. I love bonsai gardening, and it's totally cool to like repot a plant and find out it has like five foot long roots, and you should have repotted it already. It's a fun experience. Um, but actually the important thing that I wanted to bring up is the Monero Conferenza this June. June 22nd and 23rd in Denver, Colorado, we are flying people out from all over the world in order to come talk about Monero and Monero related stuff. We have people from the hardware teams. We have people uh, from venture capitalist firms. We have uh, cryptographers presenting. There is going to be at least two talks at this conference that are going to kind of be historic and groundbreaking, but I can't really talk about them yet. I don't want to hype it too much, but you guys really ought to come, especially considering tickets are, I mean, this is one of the cheapest conferences in town. Um, uh, and by in town, I mean at all. Uh, if you try to go to Consensus in New York, you're going to be spending money like crazy. If you want to come out to Denver, it's cheaper to fly to Denver and come to my conference than it is to live locally in New York and go to Consensus. Brandon, um, this sounds like a crazy good deal. Where can I learn more? Please go to monerocon.com, spelled with a K, M-O-N-E-R-O-K-O-N 
conferenco.xyz.com or go to conferenco.xyz or conference.money. I like that one. But Monero. I'll go do that right now, Brandon. <laughs> the last one sounds like an ICO. Speaking at the conference. I'm already speaking at the event. Yes, uh, Serang is one of the speakers. Uh, honestly, guys, I'm actually super excited about this and I want everybody to come out and have a good time. Uh, just to give some additional background, one section there is devoted to a breaking Monero topic. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the the idea is that breaking Monero is really sort of this white hat, black hat. Let's discuss, frankly, the trade-offs, the broken parts, the things that need to be fixed, the things that could be fixed, the things that could be improved about Monero and other protocols. We have an entire session where people are going to be presenting possibly bad stuff for Monero. Um, uh, it, this is all in the interest of making Monero better. One of the very first papers I wrote for Monero Research Lab was a criticism of uh, chain reactions and the ring sizes that we currently, what, that we had at the time. Um, the best way to make Monero better is to criticize us because first we get all defensive and huffy and then we realize that you're right and then we make a change. Um, so uh, honestly, it's going to be a good time. We're going to have a whole session uh, talking about the weaknesses in Monero for breaking Monero. And I hope that Justin can come out and moderate that particular session. Uh, we'll see if, if that works out, though. Oh, and um, there will be an intercontinental streaming panel that we're collaboratively doing with Zcon One over in Croatia. So the Zcash Foundation, along with Monero community, donated to the community crowdfunding system in order to get the Monero Conferenzo off the ground. And we're going to be doing an intercontinental streaming panel about government regulation and privacy. We're going to have folks from Coin Center. We're going to have Eric Voorhees from Shapeshift. We're going to have one of the Zcash developers. It's, it's going to be a good time. I'll stop harping on it now. Wow, what a fantastic offer that you cannot pass up as a viewer. All right. Uh, thank you so much to both of you, Sarang and Brandon, for joining me today for this mailbag episode. Thank you for everyone who submitted those questions. I hope that we were able to answer them uh, today during this 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 episode, which was um, unfortunately delayed a good period of time. But we're finally going to be coming out with more breaking the narrow episodes in the future. So thank you for joining us. Uh, take care and keep us staying critical of Monero. Bye.